prison. And if, for some reason, you are unfamiliar with the concept, I'll let a beloved children's entertainer explain it to you in a clip that has in no way dated badly. Now, all of those people who are in prison right now were kids once, just like you. And then, somewhere along the way, they did something wrong, something dumb. Whatever it was, it probably started small, became bigger. Maybe they even got away with it at first and thought they'd never get caught. They were wrong. Now, they're in prison. Yes, they are. It's almost like they should have really seen this coming. And look, on this show, we, we've talked before about the problems of mass incarceration, but this story isn't so much about who is in prison or whether they should be there. It's about what they are doing while they are inside, which is to say that, broadly, it's a story about prison labour because over 60% of people in prison actually have jobs. In fact, prisons are basically operated by the inmates, as you would know if you've ever seen an episode of Lock Up Raw on MSNBC. The most common jobs are working in the kitchen or some form of janitorial duty. I, you know, clean carpet, vacuum, empty trash. I work in laundry here five days a week, Monday through Friday. He has recently landed one of the most coveted inmate jobs staff canteen clerk. I didn't come into prison with a staff canteen job. I started in food service, in the dish room, and worked my way right on through the ranks. Yeah, Oprah didn't start on Oprah Winfrey show. So... I mean, he is right, of course. Oprah didn't start on the Oprah Winfrey show. Oprah started when a glowing magical orb consolidated all of the Earth's energy into one mesmerizing, perfect beacon of light. Then the light fucked the orb, and the result was Oprah. That's Oprah's origin story right there. But there are some major differences between the jobs people do in prison and the ones they do on the outside, particularly when it comes to money. The average wage in prison is around 63 cents per hour. And remember, that's the average. So that means there are states where prisoners make considerably less. In Texas, Georgia, Arkansas, and Alabama, prisoners are not paid for their work at all. And in some places, they're required to work under threat of disciplinary action. If they say, no, I'm not going to work, they can write you up for that, they can send you to solitary for that. That's, that's, now that's slavery. To, to work for free? Yeah. And then they Under can press. and yeah. they can put you in solitary if you don't yeah. work or write you up for not working yeah. for free. What, why is that not slavery? Yeah, that's not good because why is that not slavery? Is one of those questions that even if you have to ask it, something has already gone very wrong. <laughs> like how many swastika tattoos or <laughs> which of mommy's nightstand drawers did you open? <laughs> Things are already bad. We just need to figure out how bad. <laughs> And the answer to why is this not slavery is, well, it's not exactly not slavery, because it turns out treating prisoners as slaves is literally written into the Constitution. The 13th Amendment states that slavery is abolished except as a punishment for a crime. And the amendment abolishing slavery is really not the one that you want to suddenly include the word except. And look, I, I know that to many, inmates are not a naturally sympathetic group of people. In fact, when there was a push to get a higher wage for those working behind bars a few years ago, these people on Fox found it hilarious. Inmates behind bars are now suing for the minimum wage for the work they're doing behind bars. Should that be a crime? He says he deserves minimum wage, as if <laughs> crime pays. Why let crime pay? Exactly. Crime should not pay. It's very simple. Common sense is very simple. It's common sense. It's very simple. <laughs> Look, first of all, if you watch that on mute, you would definitely assume it was a panel on erectile dysfunction. And, <laughs> and even with the sound on, you, you can't definitely say it's not. But, but in a way, in a way, I actually get it. Crime doesn't pay does sound like common sense. But it's much, much more complicated than that. The truth is, when you combine the low to non-existent wages that prisoners get paid with the surprisingly high costs that they and their families can incur while they're inside, the current system can wind up costing all of us. And tonight, we're going to look into how, how prisoners make and spend money and the companies that have managed to get rich off them. And let's start with the fact that prison labour can take many forms. It is often the janitorial or kitchen work that you saw earlier, but in some states, prisoners actually work as firefighters. In fact, in the California wildfires last year, around 12% of the firefighters were current inmates. And I should say, many of them find fighting fires very rewarding. Just the other day, we were able to save houses from from burning down to have a woman come out to her backyard and thank us for saving her house makes us 
feel like we're doing something. Now being able to give back and potentially save lives is, um, it's huge. Yeah, and that makes sense. Being able to save lives must be very satisfying. It's why Batman always seems to be in such a good mood. <laughs> and why his catchphrase is, We am Batman! How great is fighting crime! It's great! I love it! <laughs> and, and that honestly feels like the best-case scenario for prison labour. People who are happy to work, contributing to society and learning new skills. Although it is worth noting, those firefighters' base pay is only between three and five dollars per day for that dangerous work. And if you're thinking, well, at least they're learning skills that will help them get a job on the outside, that is often not the case. California law bars most people with a criminal record from becoming licensed emergency responders, which means that being a firefighter in prison is not unlike being an art history major in college. <laughs> it may be fun while you're in there, but you're not going to be doing it once you get out. <laughs> Do you hear that, Thessaly? You're going to work in human resources, you're going to have a favourite coffee mug and a throw pillow that says it's wine o'clock somewhere, and you're going to stare out the window, yearning for the sweet release of death, just like everybody else. <laughs> and, incidentally, fighting fires is far from the only dangerous job that prisoners do. At Louisiana State Penitentiary, some take part in a prison rodeo where the entertainment can be insane. Take convict poker. Four inmates uh -oh. sit nervously at a card table, a very restless bull picks out his target. The last one standing or sitting wins. So why do you do this? Money. Yeah. I'm broke. I'm trying to get a private investigator on my case. He earns two cents an hour working in the prison fields, but he can earn hundreds out in that mud. <laughs> Holy shit! That is truly shocking. Also, and look, this really isn't the biggest issue there, but if you are going to have a game where a bull attacks a group of people, you don't name it convict poker, you name it dodgeball. Again, not the, not the biggest issue, not the biggest issue, but I, I, I did want to bring it up. <laughs> and look, and be, being attacked by a bull for entertainment is clearly an outlier. Most prisoners are doing routine labour for little to no money. The problem is, that can lead to them being seen less as humans paying their debt to society and more as a pool of virtually free labour. And don't, don't take that from me. Listen to Louisiana Sheriff Steve Prater. When the state, as part of a prison reform programme, started releasing some inmates, he went public with an unusual complaint. In addition to the bad ones, and I call these bad, in addition to them, they're releasing some good ones that we use every day to, to wash cars, to change oil in our cars, to cook in the kitchens, to do all that where we save money. Well, they're going to let them out. The ones that we use in our work release program, they're going to let them out. Just think about what he's saying there. He's saying some people need to stay behind bars because they're too valuable as a source of free labour, which is exactly the same plan as the villain in the Shawshank Redemption. <laughs> Normally, to qualify as a Stephen King villain, you have to be something way less stupid, like an evil car or a guy who forgot to wear a coat. <laughs> and, and look, many prisoners do prefer having jobs to just sitting in their cells all day, which, again, makes sense. So getting rid of prison labour entirely is not the answer here. Paying prisoners more might help, although that will be very difficult. Prisons are now so reliant on their labour, moving to a competitive wage could cost hundreds of millions of dollars each year. And I know that there are those out there who might say, well, what do prisoners even need money for? But the answer to that question is actually really important here. Because while it may seem like you're living for free in prison, you may actually have a lot of expenses, like legal fees or basic necessities like soap or shampoo. And as lawmakers in Arizona recently discovered, prisons there were actually requiring women to buy personal hygiene products. There's a new bill in the legislature that would have the state pay for all feminine hygiene products. And first to hear the proposal, a committee of nine men, some of them a bit squeamish about taking on the task. I guess hearing the bill was something I didn't expect. I didn't expect to hear pads and tampons and, and the problems of periods. Okay. <laughs> okay, so two things there. First, the problem of period sounds like the title of a medical textbook written back in the time when we used to treat female emotions with either electrocution or drowning. <laughs> and second, I am frankly shocked that a man who willingly chose that haircut isn't more of an expert on women. <laughs> but... But the fact is, 
until last year, Arizona's female prisoners were allotted just 12 pads per month, which, as I am going to say, at least half of you know, often isn't nearly <laughs> enough. And extra hygiene products were not a minor expense. Base pay for prisoners starts at 15 cents an hour, which meant that to buy one additional pack of pads took about 21 hours of work. And in theory, women who needed more could simply ask prison guards or get a medical dispensation. But the problem is, in Arizona, as in many places, prisoners also have to pay a copay to see a doctor. And I'll let a former prisoner addressing that panel tell you how that worked out in reality. The most important thing, if I want to request um, the medical right to get more pads because, say, I have a heavier flow this month than last month, I would have to pay $4 just to be seen by medical. Now, when I'm making nine cents uh, after tax, you gotta really think if I wanna put my whole month's income into hopefully being allowed, uh, approved for extra pads, if they believe I deserve it. Look, not only is it utterly ridiculous that she needs to pay to make a case that she deserves access to pads, just spare a thought for her having to discuss the details of a heavy flow into this bewildered face. <laughs> So it's pretty clear that for many prisoners, there is an enormous gap between what they make at their prison job and having enough for basic necessities. Now, if they are lucky, they might have family or others on the outside willing to help them out by sending them money. But even that is more complicated than it appears. And this brings us to the final absurd element here, the for-profit companies who stand between prisoners and the outside world. Because let's say that you want to send money to your incarcerated son or daughter. One of the biggest companies that lets families do that is JPay. But there is a catch. In lots of states, families have to go through JPay to send money into a prison at all. For almost 450,000 families, JPay is the only way to send an inmate money, and the company charges them fees as high as 45%. To give him $50, I have to, I have to send 70 off of my card. It's hard to some people like Pat Taylor, who are barely scraping by. I just let a bill go. <laughs> I let a bill go and pick it up later. It's true. It costs her $20 just to send 50. So you know what that means? Look out, Ticketmaster, when it comes to dickish transaction fees, <laughs> there's a new asshole in town. <laughs> and, and charging families to transfer money isn't the only way companies can profit. JPay's parent company, Securus, is also a leader in the field of charging prisoners for phone calls and video visits, which is a $1.2 billion a year industry. Securus has ads which play like a shitty Apple commercial, but make it look like it's a warm, fuzzy company focused on human connections. And it's, and it's honestly nice that they are fully acknowledging how important it is for people to connect to others on the phone. It's frankly a lesson that AT&T would do well to take. <laughs> Boom! You suck it, business daddy! <laughs> business baby ain't never getting in line! This baby rides dirty! Wah, <laughs> wah! I'm fuzzy! Wah, <laughs> wah! <laughs> Don't rub my tummy, I won't be settled! Wah! <laughs> But what, what that ad doesn't make clear is just how expensive they have successfully made those vital connections. Phone calls within states can go over a dollar per minute, and facilities served by Securus have had fees over three dollars for the first minute and 16 cents for each additional one, and that can really add up, which can be a massive problem for prisoners' families who may have limited resources. Shayna Pallas is married to a man who is currently facing a seven and a half year sentence in prison. Pallas has been paying high telephone fees, trying to keep her daughter connected to her father however she can. <gasps> Where'd daddy go? Look, look. But at six dollars a call, keeping that connection isn't easy. You know, some people might not see six dollars a day as a lot, but when you have an infant, you know, six dollars a day is half of, you know, a pack of diapers. And that is rough. You should not have to choose between letting your kid talk to her dad and buying them diapers. That is pretty much the definition of a shitty, shitty situation. <laughs> and if you curtail or remove that connection, it can have serious consequences on life inside the prison, as those who have been there can tell you. All a lot of guys have when they're incarcerated are those phone calls, those letters, those visits. That's it. That's what they live for. That's how they get through their time. I've seen guys their family didn't come see them in a week or two, and the next thing you know, they ended up in a hole for 90 days because they just felt alone. Because you feel alone. You can't build a family in prison. He's right. Contact with families is incredibly important and completely unrelated. In the hole for 90 days is also how Sting describes a quickie. 
And, and, and if you're thinking, well, hold on, maybe families can just get around phone charges by visiting their loved ones in person. They can, although that is changing too. Prisons, and especially jails, have been phasing out in-person visits in favour of video visitation, meaning that you can turn up to see a loved one and still have to sit in a different room and talk to them on a screen. Incredibly, this is something Securus has contractually mandated. Up until 2015, some of their contracts with facilities had them promise to eliminate all face-to-face -face visitation. And that is just evil! Machine that makes money by stopping people from seeing their families. Sounds like an item at the top of Satan's Amazon wish list, right before super bed bugs, cauliflower rice, and just the actual <laughs> existence of Amazon. And while this sounds inhumane, the people running these facilities will insist that the reason for it is purely a safety issue. If you limit the people who are coming in, uh, you're going to limit the, the attempts of contraband. You don't have to worry about contraband. If you're doing a video visit, you're not going to be able to introduce contraband into the jail. OK, I get it. So it's a contraband issue. The problem with that explanation is that research shows that installing video visitation does not decrease contraband, probably because it's easier for it to come in through other ways, like through guards, staff, and occasionally through owls, although, admittedly, <laughs> that is mostly an Azkaban problem. <laughs> so... So why push video visitation so hard? It is difficult to say. I will point out it seems notable that jails and prisons often get a cut of the proceeds from phone and video calls. And while they will point out that the money goes to an inmate welfare fund, that fund is often used for things other than inmate welfare. One county spent nearly three quarters of that money on staff salaries, while another dipped into it to buy tasers. Tasers, which really stretches the definition of inmate welfare to a literally shocking degree. <laughs> and when you put all of this together, you wind up with a scenario where you're not just hurting the people who are incarcerated, you're hurting everyone around them. One in three families of inmates reported going into debt to pay for phone calls or visitation, which is terrible. And that doesn't really set up a prisoner for success once they are released. Look. The current system of low wages and high cost is clearly no good for anyone but for the companies who are somehow managing to massively profit from this. And there are things that we can do here, small and large. New York City recently made phone calls from jails free, and Connecticut will consider similar legislation next year. And if we want to make bigger changes, like paying prisoners more, we could do that. Although, as I've said, it would undeniably be incredibly expensive and very unpopular. You saw people argue, crime doesn't pay. That's just common sense. But part of the way mass incarceration persists in this country is by keeping the true costs of it off the books. And we're currently doing that through a combination of underpaid labour from prisoners themselves, financially draining families who've done absolutely nothing wrong, and occasionally managing to monetize prisoners being launched into the fucking air with livestock. And at that point, I would argue we've come a long, long way from common sense.